What's up, guys, and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil, here with my friend Jeremy. Say hello. Hello. And we're here to talk about The Mandalorian Episode 4. This will be a full recap and review. That means it's going to be full of spoilers, so if you haven't watched the episode yet, do that and then listen to this episode. But with that, Jeremy, what were your just high-level thoughts on the episode? Uh, I thought it was another another high quality episode. A lot of checked all the Star Wars boxes. Um, another in line with the previous ones, pretty self contained story. We get maybe a little bit more character development than we did in, mm-hmm. in old ones, but uh, pre- very self contained, very very satisfying. A lot of a lot of good stuff. How about you? Um, this might be the first one where we disagree a little bit because okay. I. <laughs> I, I actually I kind of hated this episode. Interesting. And I I kind of I've, I've sort of accepted that on this show we're going to have episodes like one and three where it progresses the plot in a significant way. Then you'll have episodes like episode two and in this episode four where it's a little bit more of a episodic self-contained story. And I don't mind the self-contained story, but this one felt like it was so full of tropes which I know so of the other episodes. And this one felt super rushed, which again, so have all the other episodes. But I think the difference with this one is that they tried to squeeze in a lot more story. So it felt more rushed than I'm used to. And because of that, I think that puts a lot more pressure on the writing and the acting and everything to be really top notch. And I just don't think it was. So I think some of the the stuff I didn't like in previous episodes just bothered me more in this episode, you know, versus previous ones, where even though it felt a little rushed and it was full of tropes, the, like, this, the sort of simplicity of just seeing Mandalorian be a badass, Baby Yoda, that kind of overpowered it, and I just enjoyed it. This one, and I'll be a little nitpicky, I guess, during the recap, just for those reasons, kind of didn't work as well for me. Yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, there were there's definitely some some pacing things, and there were some moments that we'll get to where I found myself going like, Wait, how long did that just take? Or what? What? What was the time? How long have they been here? How long was? Mm-hmm. You know, I guess the training section probably was the largest. Yeah, I think part we, of that. we have the same but parts in mind. I we'll, think uh, we'll certainly get to uh, get to all that stuff. Awesome. Well, uh, let's jump into it. All right, I'm going to try to take the reins here on the recap. I apologize if I took too many notes. We'll move through it. Uh, okay, so we open. In a kind of a picturesque uh, village, there's a lot of everyone's kind of working, but they seem very happy. Uh, they're 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 krill farming, as we later find out. But you know, whatever we can know that now. This people with baskets in the water and stuff. Um, there's a little girl trying to catch this really cool Star Warsy looking one eyed kind of frog thing. Um, and then very quickly the scene turns. It become it seems to become like almost overcast uh kind of out of nowhere there's there's laser fire everywhere um and it is a to me super heavy like lord of the rings kind of vibe yeah, because this fog rolls in basically orcs uh mm-hmm. come out of the of the fog uh they look like people from lord of the rings mm-hmm. there's this kind of tribal horn style music uh playing and they basically attack the village. Um, I specifically noted for some reason that one stabs a droid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because that was just heartbreaking. Yeah. It These just, droids just feel like they get caught in the crossfire and they yeah. don't they don't deserve it. He didn't. It just seemed like completely gratuitous. Yeah. Like he didn't have to. What was the droid going to do? The fish collected, the krill collecting droid. That was going to be the, uh, that one needed to go. Um, and then we see a, a, a woman um, whose name is Omera, but I don't think we ever hear that in the episode. But I think I, at one point they might say her name, or I might have picked it up from the closed caption. I forget. Mm, that could be. That could also be it. Uh, she and her daughter are kind of, they hide. Uh, everybody else flees or, or is, you know, victim to this attack. And she and her daughter hide under the in the water underneath this, like, basket. Um, and when I was going through this, at fr- my first watching of it, I was thinking, like, is this a flashback? Is this child somehow related to the Mandalorian in mm-hmm. some way? Or is the Mandalorian? And this is a some kind of precursor. Even though the setting from the other flashbacks that we see looks pretty different. I don't know. Something about it. Yeah, I immediately thought we were seeing the Purge. Or the Great Purge that kept making reference to. So I thought that at any second I was expecting giant droids to come out of the trees. And then when it was orcs. Or Clatuinians. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes. That's when I knew. Um, 
Yeah, I I agree. It was kind of I, I was I was never really positive on the tone until you know later on when they're right. when they see both people in the same place. Uh, so that's the open, and then we go to uh, to space where we get another uh, of the of the 2019 meme lord, Baby Yoda. Right. <laughs> uh, at which every scene, and I guess if you if you could watch all the old Star Wars movies and they had first come out in 2019, you also would have thought there were many things that were specifically designed for. Uh, Instagram likes or, or something like that, <laughs> but this Baby Yoda scene is this: he just keeps hitting a button, and the and the don't do that. is like, don't touch that. It's it's very classic, like parent child. Yeah. Uh, I've had friends who theorize that they think that some of this meme stuff is manufactured by Disney. That maybe they're getting influencers to post Baby Yoda memes. I I would definitely believe that. Yeah. I would 100% believe that. <laughs> but I think I think he might have taken off even without the meddling because Baby Yoda's yeah, great. Yeah, I agree. Baby Yoda's great. It's it's hard to... There's just such a, an innocence about Baby Yoda that mm-hmm. it is very hard to like genuinely dislike, I think. Right. And by the way, I also wanted to point out, just to earn some Star Wars cred, so I mentioned that those uh, orc-like aliens that attacked were Klaatuinians. And we've seen a Klaatuinian in Return of the Jedi named uh, Barada, which mm. is a reference to the day the Earth stood still where they were attacked, where the movie's about an alien attacking. And to stop the robot that was attacking, you had to say Klaatu Barada Niktu. So Klaatu, the name of the alien race and the name of the alien in the day the Earth stood still. Barada, the name of of the alien in Star Wars, and Niktu, there was also an alien race in Return of the Jedi named Niktu. Wow. Barada, not the um, like Italian not the cheese. creamy <laughs> cheese inside the other cheese. It was like a Russian doll of Easter eggs. <laughs> one within the other within the other. A reference to a reference. <laughs> we have to go deeper. Uh, great. Excellent. Um, okay, so... They're on the, you know, Baby Yoda's hitting the button. He then, Mandalorian then uh, basically discovers a planet and is like announcing to himself um, that it looks very desolate and no one's going to find them there. There's no starport on the planet. Exactly, no starport. So it looks like a a great place that they can, you know, be, uh, exist on the lam for a little bit and kind of settle down until they they figure out what's next. Um, Which is exactly what they attempt to do there's a cool shot when they land that he mandalorian tells him to basically stay exactly where he is baby yoda don't go anywhere right. he speaks very slow it's pretty patronizing and condescending <laughs> um don't touch anything and then there's this great shot when the door comes down and he goes to get off and when the door lowers all the way you see that baby yoda is right next to him and yeah and he doesn't sits. it feel like a really bad idea by the way to leave baby yoda yes unattended seems, seems like a worse idea yeah so i think baby yoda had it right to be like hell no I'm not staying on this ship, on this planet we don't know anything about. Right. Like, I'm going to stick with you, the guy with the gun. Yeah, and he knows. I don't know if I'm jumping too far ahead and maybe this is out of order and screwing up. Did they have any reason to believe that the fobs did, were like, were not tracking Baby Yoda <laughs> I, anymore? Because the only thing we learned from the previous episode was that literally every person that we have encountered <laughs> had one of these fobs. And I guess maybe he thought it was only on that planet and, and Carl Weathers was the only person that was giving out those fobs. So Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Well, so I think the fobs only work when you're within a certain proximity of whatever you're going after. Got it. That's why when he was going after Baby Yoda, they gave him a fob and they gave him the last known location. So if you don't know what planet they're on, the fob is useless to you. Makes sense. That's, that's, that was my read on it. It's like a key fob in real life. Like if you have one of those to get into your apartment and someone finds yours. Exactly. They can't, you know. Um, okay, so then they so they, they leave. Baby Yoda's with Mandalorian. Uh, we get another kind of classic Star Wars uh, cantina-ish mm-hmm. type scene. We see a bunch of different uh, aliens. There is the, um, the Loth cat that snarls at <laughs> Baby Yoda. Uh, Loth cats were apparently pretty... Um, uh, all over the place in the Star Wars Rebels cartoon. Oh, uh, okay. This was the first live action appearance, I guess li- live action in quotes because of CGI, but uh, mm. of of a Loth cat. I love the idea of uh, crossing characters over from animated to live action because I'm always so curious, especially if it's if if we see it happen with a human character, 
It's like, are you going to cast the guy who did the voice or the guy, the girl who did the voice for that character? Are you going to cast somebody else? And how do you make it? I guess this one's easier because it's uh, still a CGI creature. But I'm curious if we see more, if we're going to see more of that. Yeah. Um, but it's cool seeing Mandalorian as he walks in. Uh, they pass by a, at the time, unknown woman. But I think it kind of sets up right away, even from the first glance. I mean, I guess if you know the actress... Uh, then you, of course, know that she's going to be involved. You know she's going to be prominent. Um, he sits down with Baby Yoda. The, the bartender person comes over, and he orders a, some bone broth, and he <laughs> is trying to find out um, more about the woman, but the bartender kind of doesn't really give anything up. He looks over again, and she is no longer there. Right. Very mysterious. By the way, this is where I started to feel some of the, the cracks of the episode, because I thought the waitress who came over... I thought the acting was a little rough. And, and and some of it's not her fault. Like when she has to say lines like, I'll throw in a flagon of spotchka just for good measure. <laughs> it's, it's tough to sell the alien word, the alien words. And, uh, you know, you've got Carl Weathers doing it and he's a seasoned actor. So maybe he was able to sell it a little bit better. Uh, that's when I started to worry a little bit, but. Yeah, I, I'll also say I wasn't sure if we were supposed to think that, like, something was up with her. Mm-hmm. Like, she knew, like, oh, this is a trap. Mandalorian's walking in. I got to right. play it <laughs> straight, but I can't because I'm nervous. Or, you know. Yeah. Like you and then when you saw to. all the other villagers were also acting that way. Right. Like, all right, there's no conspiracy. This is just, yeah. you know, not the best actors or maybe not the best direction. I'm not sure. Um, so then we, we do get a great Mandalorian line coming up, though, because uh, when when the woman is gone, uh, Cara Dune is her name, as we later right. learn, uh, when she's gone, he goes up to follow her, flips some kind of currency to the bartender lady, and says, keep an eye on the kid, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is really cool. I thought a little corny, but like awesome in a great, in the way that I am finding the tone of this whole mm-hmm. series to be. Um he goes outside, tracks her down, she ambushes him, they have a fight. He takes out a flamethrower at one point, which <laughs> seems super like he definitely would have killed her with that. <laughs> right. And then they both kill out pull out guns, and we get our second huge meme moment of the episode, uh, Baby Yoda sipping the soup. Yeah, I've been seeing those memes all week. Yeah. And uh, I have to say though, I'm a little bit sick of seeing Mando lose a fight every episode. Mm. Uh, and I get that they're trying to establish that Cara Dune is as much of a badass as he is. I kind of wish they found a way to do it without it being at his expense. Just because, I mean, he's like a badass character. You want him to be awesome. You want it to be believable that he's able to survive through all these kind of against the odds situations. But if every episode he loses or ties in a fight, it starts to kind of stretch credulity. Uh, but I did like that I feel like in another show, he might insist on staying, even though Kara's there and basically saying, hey, I found this planet first. But here, you know, he says to Baby Yoda, looks like this planet's taken already. Let's go. So I appreciated that. Yeah. Um, I Yeah, I, I, I liked that as well. Uh, I fully agree on the fight thing. It's interesting. It's kind of like the opposite of the usual Star Wars criticism, which is like, why can this person do every single thing? You know, say it about Ray and the new right. stuff. They say it about kid Anakin in the prequels and the way that he kind of, you know, is untouchable. And it's almost like the opposite with this. Like, why is he so beatable in some <laughs> instances? We want to believe that he's the unbeatable warrior. Why does, uh, you know, this, the, uh, I can't remember the name of the thing that he has to ride in the, in the, oh, the, uh, the, the blarg like why does that yeah, give him, yeah why right. does that give him such trouble and why does he lose this fight but then he can also take down the full thing of stormtroopers so yeah i i, I see what you're saying that there's a little kind of yeah they got to find that middle ground they'll find it yeah um so they go back in she starts talking about her past a little bit and then like you say they basically she says that she's planet's taken so he goes mm. to leave with baby yoda uh they go back to the ship they get approached by two villagers as they're about to leave. They basically have another, you know, like you're say, like you would say, another kind of side quest thing for the Mandalorian. Hey, you know, before you get out of here, a couple of these raiders, they attacked our village. We're just curl farmers. We got to, you know. Uh, he originally says no, which is an interesting, I think, from a character development point mm-hmm. of view, because he's like, you don't have enough money. I don't. So if you had any doubts on oh he you know he left with baby yoda he went back to rescue him mandalorian has gone soft 
definitely not. He's going to leave these people here to die to whatever these raiders are because they don't have enough money and it doesn't help his interest at all until they say that they're going back to the middle of nowhere, which he suddenly realizes he can use right. for lodging. <laughs> and that, that that was another example of uh, the writing in this episode that kind of bothered me. Yes. Like he needs to hear, wait a minute, they live in the middle of nowhere? That the whole planet is the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And do you just not realize that the concept of middle of nowhere exists? I mean, any planet, you can find a location that's in the middle of nowhere. Right. You've agreed to stay because they happen to have a house there. It just felt like not enough reason for him to change his mind about leaving. He also agreed to leave because of one person in one bar. <laughs> so it, it was kind of it was kind of both ways there. And they go a little bit over the top too after they say middle of nowhere. He, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but he basically says, "Did you just say middle of nowhere?" And they're like, "Yeah, we're farmers. What did you think we did? You know, we are, but simple cruel farmers." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, and I think uh, maybe I'm maybe the reason that I'm more on board with the episode than than you are is because I'm just I've just accepted that the that's kind of that is the the if there's a childish aspect to the show, it's that the storytelling part is pretty simplistic, and at its worst, it means they like hit you over the head with cheesy stuff or redundant stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but at its at its best, I guess you get is when you get the watch the kid kind yeah. of stuff. <laughs> that, that's the show at its peak. <laughs> yeah, I mean to me, the little cool yeah. one liner. Things. No, no, same for me. And I think, like I said, I'm still on board with this show. I think this episode is just the the childish stuff because so much happened in this episode. It just felt like there was more of it than than I've had in the previous episodes. Um. All right. So they go back to the village. They stay. Uh, this is where we get our our. You know, bigger scene with uh, O'Mara. And right before this, uh, Mando goes and recruits Kara for help. He basically says, hey, we can get good lodging. Seems like a pretty good deal for a couple of uh, people that are on the lam. Um, nah, he didn't use those words. But. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he basically did. Um, so he, he goes, Mandalorian and Baby Yoda get their, like, lodging from O'Mara. Uh she uh they kind of set up the thing it has a super western vibe where like the gunslingers coming into town and right. and the like quaint um person is setting setting up the house um the daughter he there's this moment where Omera's daughter goes to peek in the doorway kind of when he's sitting there and Mandalorian like instinctively turns around and whips out a gun which is crazy but <laughs> but that's what happens and then she says oh no this is my this is my daughter, uh, Winta. That's right. Um, and and says to Winta that this nice man is going to help protect us from the bad ones, which is also maybe <laughs> too on the nose, but I guess she's talking to a child, so so it's okay. Um, Winta plays with Baby Yoda a little bit. And when uh, Winta goes to leave the house with Baby Yoda, you can see Mando's concerned to mm. let Baby Yoda stroll around town, and Omra's like, they'll be fine. I Mando. just think that they'll be fine. Which, yeah. how does she know they'll be fine? <laughs> They're getting attacked by orcs left yeah, and like, right. Uh, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. So that that was one where I trusted, I think, Mando's instincts were right in that scene. Um, and then we get perhaps our most interesting background details about Mandalorian in, in the entire episode where she asks a question that we addressed uh, yes. last week. Uh, or How episode. long has it been since you've taken that off the helmets? And he first says yesterday, and I, my jaw dropped. Yeah, because I was I, I was going I was researching this online, and I kept googling. And if you searched like do Mandalorians, and then the first suggestion <laughs> take off their helmet, or mm -hmm. how do they eat? And people are like, they take their helmet off. They just meant they don't take them off in front of other people. And I was like, I don't know about that. I interpreted it to be very literal. They never take them off. Turns out I was wrong. Uh, and then and then we get a little more stuff. He tells her, my parents were killed and the Mandalorians took care of me. And that's kind of why he... Which to me kind of had the same sort of vibe as uh, Obi-Wan saying, uh, you know, Darth Vader killed your father, which obviously is what he meant genuinely when the mm -hmm. movie first came out. But maybe now just in, in Star Wars hindsight, I hear something like that where he just vaguely says it. And I'm like, ah, I wonder if that's real or not. Right. Or... 
you know, I don't know, his parents uh, betrayed, went to the Empire. Even though it seems like we've seen enough flashbacks and I don't think this is that kind of show where they're going to pull some crazy swerve on a backstory thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. But did you take that to mean that he was not born into the Mandalorian culture and he was sort of adopted by Mandalorians? That's how I took it, definitely. And, And that's, I was theorizing, I wanted to pat myself on the back here because I was theorizing that maybe part of the title... Considering the fact that there are so many Mandalorians, this is called The Mandalorian, and I think part of that might be referring to the fact that he's kind of an outsider, even within the Mandalorian culture. But maybe we'll find out that it's not uncommon for people to be adopted by them or for people to move you know, into, be, to basically become a Mandalorian even though you weren't born into it. Yeah, there's another quick allusion to that kind of thing when he's with the... Uh when the guys are trying to get him to come back when he's cleaning his ship and he's about to leave. And the guy says, like, your spe- uh, your tribe, uh, like he yeah. <laughs> nervously, like, backpedals, out, seemingly to not offend him because he's walking on some kind of line. But that, that made me think of that, too, kind of like, well, what is Mandalorian? Is it a race? Is it a tribe? Is right. it a- you know, we, all I could think about in that scene was our first episode <laughs> yeah, where yeah. you were. <laughs> is yeah. it okay to call him Mando? <laughs> yeah, and I guess the yeah, I guess it is. So then. Mando and and uh, Cara Dune go to kind of investigate what's Wait, going on. Wait, before that, after Mando explains, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. hasn't taken his takes helmet it off, off right it. away in a window <laughs> exactly. with kids looking at him. He hasn't taken the helmet off since he was a child, maybe thirty years. He takes it off right in the window, right in the and window, and they're not that far away. And that bothered me. Yeah, I did write it like that, and then I just skipped over it. Yeah, so like, well, looking out a window, three question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so he does that. He somehow th- that doesn't get no. He's otherwise a cautious, uh, pretty close to the vest person, but he doesn't <laughs> doesn't care about that, I guess. Uh, so then Mandalorian and Cara Dune go to kind of investigate what's going on with the Raiders group, uh, and they find the ATST tracks. That's right. Which my familiarity with ATSTs is from a bunch of YouTube videos I've been watching recently. Of uh, Force, what was the, what's the name of the new Star Wars game? Uh, Jedi Fallen Order. Yeah, yeah, where you fight ATSTs. You do, yeah. In the game, they don't look very hard to defeat. I saw a video where you just kick it and it like fell off a cliff. But I guess I guess that's kind of similar to this episode where you need something for it to fall into, right? To defeat it, or two logs to crush its head, like the Ewoks do in oh, Return, Return of the, of the Jedi. Jedi. Yeah. Um, and so are ATSTs like small versions of ATATs? Uh, correct. The S is for Scout. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Um, so they're kind of the they are the smaller ones, and then the ATATs are like the big, obviously giant, the four legged ones from you know, by, uh, a lot of places, but iconically uh, Battle of Hoth when the speeders wrap the tow cables around their legs and they fall over. Right. Um, but yeah, this this is probably the most intense ATSTs look is in this episode of Mandalorian I would say than anything I guess other than like Battle of Hawthorne there's a million of them and they look intimidating this mm-hmm. w- one by itself looks pretty it looks vicious yeah. the red eyes the red eyes yeah it Which, moved faster than you would expect a big robot to move it moves in a very like personified way mm-hmm. like when it uh you know, I mean, when it eventually... I will get to it. Oh, and a quick, uh, another good one-liner from Cara Dune there where she notices the tracks and she goes, this is more than I signed up for. <laughs> uh, I just thought that was a, a kind of a dumb, funny line. So they then go back to the town and Mandalorian just tells everyone, like, yeah, you, you gotta leave. We can't... Right. Uh, you can't do anything here. Very defeatist attitude. Given everything he's been through, very defeatist attitude. Yeah. Bad news. You can't live here anymore. And then Kara tries to do better, right? And tells uh tells everybody you gotta move. Everybody refuses. You know, we've been here for years. We're not leaving. Uh um, right. yeah, and this is another kind of in line with everything else classic uh you can't do this. Yes we can, yes you can. Kind of right. kind of scene. Uh where you know, they've they after Omera says that they're not leaving, Kara says they can't fight and uh, they can't fight that thing. And Mandalorian says, unless we show them how, you know, <laughs> so um, he went from uh, 10 seconds ago. You can't live here anymore. And then when people said we've been living here for a while, then I guess he changed his mind. Yeah. 
Yeah, this whole this whole scene really didn't work for me. And this is where I, I don't think the villagers in general were great actors. And I think some of it is just, again, they're trying to pack so much in. So you'd have to act very strongly to sell all of it. Uh, and then not only that, when they immediately go from this scene into, okay, we're going to train all of you to help fight. Then we get a montage. And there's a sequence where I think Kara asks, who here knows how to shoot? And then Omara <laughs> looks around and slowly raises her hand. So I'm just so sick of that trope. Yeah, which is especially when there's not really a payoff. And maybe there will be later down the line. I don't know. Maybe we'll end up seeing these characters again. But when you get that moment, your thought is like, what is her backstory? What just yeah. happened? She must not be a krill farmer. Is there something more at play? Is she the Mandalorian? Like <laughs> Nothing sh- came of it. Right. The only payoff... She hits is that, that pot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> During training, she hits a pot really well. Yeah. Later on, I don't even think we see her fire her gun once. <laughs> yeah. This Okay, so this is the anti-Chekhov's uh, gun principle, right? right? Like you establish a thing for no reason in an episode that as we've pointed out along the way here it has some you know there's some pacing uh not issues but it leads to that thing where you say where we get a 25 second turnaround on something going from impossible to like wait a minute we got this right uh which i don't know maybe we then maybe we didn't need that weird side plot of (laughs) does she have some crazy dark or maybe i'm wrong and there will be three episodes from now where mandalorian's uh once again on his back after a maybe a Blarg and Cara Dune attack him at the same time and then they both get picked off by, by Omara. Yeah. And he's like, wow, you really can shoot. <laughs> but I don't know, judging Told by how shoot. <laughs> this show likes to introduce things and pay them off within 10 minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I'll, I'll just say the, the, the whole thing about it being kind of rushed, I, I, they're limiting themselves to 30-minute episodes. If you're going to do 30-minute episodes... Don't shove so much into the episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and another thing during the montage. Remember in the montage, uh, it might have been episode three where he has to put his ship back together. Yeah. And oh no, episode two, right? Two. Yeah. yeah. And you see the Mandalorian kind of bang his fist on the wall yeah, of the ship yeah, like, yeah. as if it's doing anything. There was a moment like that here where the guy's stabbing his uh, spear, and Kara's like, "Come on, get into it." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, good training. Great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then we get to the, the attack uh, phase of it. The Mandalorian and Cara Dune go to attack the base. The plan, which Kara explains right before this, is that they're going to go basically lure the ATST into a uh, back to the village, and there's going to be a hole that it's going to step into, right. which will uh, defeat it in a, in a clever Ewok-ish kind of uh, shenanigans way. Um so they go, Mandalorian and Cara Dune, they, uh, first they take out these two guys sitting by a campfire, classic spot for the first two guys, yep. in any kind of a takeout situation. If you're a bad guy, don't sit by a campfire. Yeah, it was the equivalent of like the guy smoking the cigarette like under the street light. Like, you know he's the first guy gone. 100%. He's going to get his next snack. Like, I can't believe I pulled guard duty again. Like That guy's gone every time. Wasn't even supposed to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they take out those two guys. And then they go into this tent where they uh, Mandalorian like plants a bomb on this center post, and then they're about to leave. Uh, Cara Dune whistles to signify that two guys are coming, <laughs> um, and then they have kind of a cool fight scene. A bunch of guys keep coming. They take out two guys, two more come in. They take right. out two guys, two more come in. Um, it's the slightly action movie trope thing where the bomb lasts exactly long enough for them to fight the precise number of guys that came in yeah that that kind of bothered me a little bit yeah because we've seen him use bombs like that we see him use one later in the episode yes why was this one set to take like four minutes before it blew up and and also during the fight scene when they walk into this this uh sort of tent or something there's these vats of blue liquid Mm -hmm. and during the fight Kara grabs one of the Klaatuinians it kind of shoves him into the vat and I couldn't tell. Is that supposed to be like acid or something? Right. And then she immediately pulls him out. And I don't know if it, if it was some kind of acid thing that harmed him. She was pretty cavalier about shoving her arms into it. And if she was just trying to drown him, he was only in there for a few seconds. Maybe it was just a shock. Maybe it was very cold. Like <laughs> maybe shock that. value. Oh, okay, it could have been like nitro, or maybe that species is 
allergic to water, like some other Spoiler. famous movie villain <laughs> uh, aliens. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't see any signs of that being the case. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so, yeah, they, they escape the tent. It blows up as soon as they walk out because, of course, um, they this is where we get our ATST crazy scary red eyes Mm -hmm. uh moment chases them through the woods it appears to be right on their tail then when we cut back to the village they have picked up a significant amount of ground on it because they get there like 30 seconds before enough for them to say shh be quiet (laughs) and luckily whoever trained the atst how to shoot is probably trained by a couple of stormtroopers yeah not not very accurate not very accurate um and then we get kind of our, our biggest indication of this weird like personification, uh, which is probably annoying, I've said it 10 times, of the ATST, where it is about to fall into the trap and it like sheepishly puts right. its toe over, like, like if you were getting into a hot tub and it was like very hot and you were unsure of how to dip your toe in the water yeah. kind of thing, <laughs> which is just a not very, you know, machine. Uh, but you don't want to get a machine wet. You know? That's true, but it was something about the specific movement of it. I don't know. I maybe I'm just comparing it to the uh, very stop motion looking ones of the mm, original true. trilogy, which wouldn't have been able to move that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's clear they want this to be like obviously evil. If you're like a little kid that doesn't know the background of Star Wars, and how do you do that? A big scary eyes and like it's dark and right. red and. Um, but it's cool. I mean, it, they make it look very tough like it looks like it's going to be a a a situation for uh for the village to try to survive this attack um so it doesn't jump into the trap then the raiders uh come back Mm. they're scary there's fog everywhere here's the payoff to that training montage we got um kara has to adapt her plan um she takes the pulse rifle from the mandalorian says that she's got a new idea Mm -hmm. she charges at the atst to you know try to get it into the water um it was very dark in this whole scene it was which is i guess a way to not have to show the nitty-gritty of everything that's going on but we get some payoff of you know the villagers can use their spears now those two guys that we see when they go to the mandalorian ship uh Mm -hmm. get uh, their couple moments in the uh in the sun and even though it was dark, one thing I did see is a quick cut to a child screaming and crying, which just made me wonder why do they have kids on the front line of this battle? Mm. Maybe should have left them back in the village. And there's some other kids that are there with Baby Yoda kind of all like huddled up, right? Is yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So yeah. A little distance would have been... Uh, they shouldn't... This is one instance where they shouldn't listen to Baby Yoda. If he's like, I'm coming with you. Then right. This is one really you should stay behind. Yeah. 100%. Um... So Cara Dune prevails in her plan. Uh, she goes in the water, shoots the ATSD with the pulse rifle a couple times. It falls down. Shoots it in the eye. Shoots it in That's the eye. That's what really got its attention to move forward. The uh, Yeah, right there in that front window there, the windshield. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> yep, it moves forward. That's what I do when I'm shot in the eye. I just walk <laughs> towards the thing hey. that shot me. Uh, it falls down. It seems like it's pretty out of shape when it falls down but just to put the icing on the cake mandalorian flies in takes what appears to be the very similar bomb to the one we saw in the tent but as you mentioned before a much quicker timer on this one like maybe five seconds yeah i guess he could just be setting it it could be like i'm assuming he sets it yeah why did he set the first one for such a long time anybody's guess who knows maybe they were maybe they were going to set it and then get a new like position on the outside of the camp, so use the explosion as a distraction misdirection and get the upper hand from the other way. Maybe right. that's why. Well, I do. Th- the, the intention of that explosion, I think, was to get the ATST's attention. Right. So, to be fair, they probably did need a little bit more time to get in there, plant the bomb, and get some distance. Right. It just felt, like we said, a little bit convenient that when, it was just the right amount of time. Especially when everything else is so, so, so explained. Like, he could, he could have just said, like, I'll set the timer for this so we can get away. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that seems like an easy, like, you know, we got all that information on the, uh, whistling birds right. from the, which we didn't need. Yeah. You know? And then or when the was... Klaatuinians attack, he could be like, we got to get out of here. That bomb's going to blow any second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's cheesier. I, 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 it feels like it's more informative, but, um, so anyway, they win the, uh, everybody else was still there after the ATSD blows up retreats. Another, 
fun action cliche line. Mandalorian says, was that the plan? Cara Dune says something like that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was a fun one. Uh, and then the, the village is saved. Main arc of, of episode over for now. Uh, we're back in the sunlight. Some amount of time has passed, presumably. I, a couple of weeks, I think, is what he alludes to. What yeah, says he says later. something like, uh, we, we raised hell a few weeks back. Yeah, which seems like a very forced line just to indicate that time has passed. <laughs> I have to say that probably my... <clears throat> I feel bad going after the show so much, but probably my biggest complaint about this episode is that when they persevered, when they won, I just didn't care. Mm. I, don't, they, I don't think they did enough to make me care about the villagers. They didn't do enough to make me feel like there was real danger. I think when the Klaatuinians showed up, and I do enjoy saying that word, yeah. when they showed up in the first scene, they did feel dangerous. They felt vicious. Uh, but I never really felt that danger again in the episode. Maybe for a moment when they first wake up, the ATST. But other than that, I never felt real peril. Yeah, and because we, we don't also really learn anything as a result of that attack. Like the most things we learn from this episode are just based on you know Omera like asking him an interesting question about his background. That's, right. That's like the bigger picture takeaways. Yeah. That, which had nothing to do with that. Could have just happened in the cantina from some exactly. Random... And and maybe if they had done more to establish any of these villagers, like Omera, if we learned a little bit more about her backstory. Right. Um, maybe we would have cared a little bit more. Um, so they're all happy. Omra points out how happy uh, Baby Yoda looks. Uh, great moment. Call back to the beginning of the episode with the one-eyed frog thing where Baby Yoda catches it and f- goes to eat it, and then the kids are kind of grossed out, and he it falls out of his mouth and hops away. Um, then another Mandalorian character-ish type reveal when he's talking to Cara Dune, who says, can't you... Why can't you just take that off? Are they going to come after you? And he says, no, you can just can't ever put it back on again. Right. It's like a losing your honor sort of thing. Right. Which seems in line with everything else of their of that we know of Mandalorian culture so far. Right. Like they're not. I mean, I was going to say they're not vindictive, but that might be wrong. But, you know, they're very honor based and, uh, you know, allegiance to their the guild code and yeah uh, i am curious if they will address the fact that we know this whole not removing your helmet thing it seems like a recent development like i pointed out in a previous episode in star wars rebels which takes place right before uh, a new hope we see them walking around without their helmets but it could also be i, I do wonder if there are multiple tribes within the mandalorian mm. culture because i think there is a planet mando Right, so maybe there are other tribes, and they don't all follow the same culture. Yeah, maybe this is just a more militant one where they have these very strict rules. Mandalore, I think, is the Mandalore. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Is it like Helmies and and <laughs> I don't know. I can't think of it. <laughs> the Helmies and non Helmies, bearheads, <laughs> and they have gang fights with each other. Or something. It's a nude face. <laughs> <laughs> Say it. Why don't you say that to my face, hell me? <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. Maybe that'll maybe we'll get to that in a later episode. Um So then Kara says, why wouldn't he just stay there and settle down with that young widow, which seemed very crass to me? Uh, yeah. I, were we supposed to there was a, a moment there where Mando and Omra are kind of looking at each other before Omra shows up. Are we supposed to feel some romantic tension there? Uh, it feels like a very, but I guess so does the Western genre. It felt like a very dated and problematic kind of romance. Yeah. <laughs> Where he like walks in, doesn't say anything. She's like, I made you breakfast and put some fresh towels out. Please save the village. Won't you stay? You know, uh, kind of vibe. Also, Wid- Widow, uh, we didn't know anything else about that, right? Other than that we haven't seen another parental figure. True, true. Do you think she killed her husband? The only things we know about her are that she's a widow <laughs> and that she can shoot. It's a good thing Mando got the hell out of because there. Because we didn't get any other background info on her. Other, I mean, I guess she was attacked, which we could have gotten background info if that was a really long time ago and she was the child, uh, but it was, that happened 10 minutes before the episode started, I right. guess. Um, yeah, maybe there's some deleted scenes out there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, you heard it here first. 
uh, Omera killed her husband, and that's why she can shoot. <laughs> so they're setting up a villain for season two, mm. Omera. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so she she asks him to stay. Uh, or she says, why wouldn't he stay? Kara says, why wouldn't he stay? He mm. says, traveling with me, that's no life for a kid. So he's going to leave baby Yoda behind, and he's going to leave. And then he goes, and I think that's where we get our first moment where you they cut away to the woods and we see a beeping fob. Right. Of like, you know, of course they need to come up with a reason that all the characters have to leave. They could just stay here forever. <laughs> it wouldn't make sense. Um, so again, somehow they were, they were tracked here. Uh, the Mandalorian goes to tell Omara that he is going to leave. She tells him to stay. It kind of feels like that Western movie Shane, where remember where like Shane after he saves the day he's gonna leave and the right. kid keeps saying, "Come back, Shane." It's kind of <laughs> I thought it was gonna go that way. Uh, she says you could have a good life here. She goes to take off the helmet. Mm-hmm. He doesn't take it off. He or he he tells her not. You know he, he gestures not to. He takes her hand or something. And then <laughs> and, and then uh, he says, "I don't belong here." Uh, but he does, and he's pointing at Yoda. And then she says, I understand. <laughs> Man, that's it. She was, was, I understand. And she says that she's going to raise him on her own, kind of uh, shades of like Obi-Wan saying he'll raise Anakin. Yeah, after he's going to adopt this alien child. Yeah. <laughs> That she knows nothing about other than he almost ate a frog thing. But right. he's happy. I, get, I understand the. I do understand the vibe of it. I just thought it was funny that she just flips so quickly. Yeah. And actually, who among us would not adopt Baby Yoda? Yeah, we all would. We all would. Which, I, by I, the way, you can adopt your own <laughs> Baby Yoda. In six months, they're going to have plush dolls on sale at Walmart. Finally. Wow. Thank you. Use <laughs> promo code one take <laughs> yeah. and uh, see what happens. I'm not sure what will happen. We'll work on that later. So then... Um, we get our second of the series gunfire swerve moment. We see the scope. It's locked in on Baby Yoda. We cut away. We hear a gunshot. Mandalorian says, hide the kids or something, whatever he says. Cut to the woods. Did the bounty hunter shoot Baby Yoda? No. Cara Dune shot the bounty hunter. Thank God. I thought second we were going to see time. a decapitated Baby Yoda. <laughs> Not only is it the second gunshot swerve, it's the second one with Baby Yoda. That's true. Each time we think, and I and let me let me be the first to say on record here, it will not be the last. <laughs> we're going to get another gunshot Baby Yoda swerve at some point. Yeah, this... maybe the last time the reveal will be that Baby Yoda had the <laughs> <laughs> Baby Yoda shot first. <laughs> Uh, this was maybe the most unforgivable part of the episode for me because <laughs> Mandalorian says, I can't stay here because people will notice. They'll come here. I'm leaving Baby Yoda here. <laughs> I, he knows that the, if people know that he's there, someone's going to go look for him. They're probably going to have a Baby Yoda fob because everyone has a Baby Yoda fob. <laughs> Irresponsible. Very irresponsible. Uh, you know, I don't know how this this bounty hunter uh, tracked them down, but obviously, you know, he won't be the last, as they quickly deduce, and uh, and so they're on their way. And then again, we get a very heavily Western influenced. Uh, they're on the back of a, you know, um, basically a wagon, caravan, a wooden wagon. speed, <laughs> yeah, a wooden yeah. speeder, basically. Uh, very tearful goodbye. The daughter Winta, very emotional uh, about baby Yoda going. Um, the goodbye with Omara, obviously, and then Kara and Mandalorian have this exchange where they both say, "Until our paths cross again," um, which led me to think. So is she another? Like, are we going to see Kara again? It is a bigger name actress, kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm very certain we're going to see her again. I'm sure we will. Yeah, I, it just feels like one of those. You know, are we going to see all these people again? That we are we going to see the the Ugnot again at some point? Right. Are we going to see? You know, we'll probably see Carl, Carl Weathers again. Cause just it's kind of so- crazy though, considering we're four episodes into an eight episode season. And they've set up so many different characters 
that I'm sure they're planning to revisit. Mm. But I doubt we're going to be able to see all of them this season. Right. And there's other people that we still haven't seen yet that we know are in the series. Giancarlo Esposito? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, we haven't seen him yet. That was the main one I was thinking of. I, there might be others, but that, that was, was the only one I was thinking of. I don't know who else is in this. Yeah, I, that was that was the big one. And I guess I had thought it about uh, about Cara Dune until this right. episode. Uh, and I'm waiting for Obi-Wan well. to show up. You never know. You never know. Uh, yeah, so the villagers wave goodbye, and, and then we uh, and we cut to cut to credits. As, as On Baby Yoda, full shot, Baby Yoda, cut to credits. Right, right. A lot of Baby Yoda this episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Again, like I said, at the out out of the gate, they're kind of very very self contained, except a couple select plot points where we get a little bit more about the uh, the Manda lore. If you'll excuse. The, oh, nice. You know, uh, there's probably a podcast called Mandalorian where they just talk about lore. If that's not taken, we should we should just reserve that now. And copyrighted. We'll mail this podcast to ourselves, <laughs> and no one can steal it. We'll save it. it on an SD card and mail it to ourselves. Uh, yeah, so I, I think I agree with your criticisms, but I I don't think this episode is exceptionally more guilty of those things than any of the other ones have been, to me, anyway. But I don't disagree with anything you said about the pacing and things being, you know, very quick with the this is impossible no it's not they do it right right yeah i think i think for me like it just felt like there was more of it but where do you think this is this is going it feels very aimless Mm. and the mandalorian right now feels very aimless where is he going i wonder is there going to be a sort of overarching plot that we really get into or is it going to be more is the next episode going to be another self-contained story um, you know, I think at least my assumption, I'm assuming most people assumed that we're going to learn a little bit more about why people are after baby Yoda and that will lead into the overarching story. But it sounds like that's going to be kind of the backbone that maybe not the focus of every episode. Yeah. It just feels a little weird to have such episodic standalone driven things when the budget is so high, the production value is so high, they take so long to make. There's only eight of them. It's Star Wars, with right? Big name actors. Um, it just makes things feel like filler episodes when it's not clear. And I don't know. I maybe there's a part of that's like, well, no, it's great writing because we're directionless, and so is the Mandalorian. So we're, you know, I, I don't right. know. Because um, I, I don't want to call it filler because I did, I did like it, and I do think we learned some things. But when you don't know where you're going, it that's what makes it feel like filler, right? Like yeah. when you're not sure, other than that, his plan is just generically to get away. And maybe that's hurt by by the fact that they only follow the Mandalorian. Maybe if we were cutting back to you know Werner Herzog. Uh, Mm-hmm. plotting uh, things would feel much more significant or you'd be going like what else is going on here I, the watchman is so heavily on my brain but where those episodes always give you the kind of ozymandias thing at the, at the back end right where you're seeing something else um and it and it makes it maybe that's cheap but it it suddenly feels a lot bigger than just here's this one guy and we're not sure where he's going. But I still like the the universe still feels really huge. I like all the little details we're getting. I think the the action is pretty good. I think the show looks amazing. It's, right. it's so well shot and everything feels really well thought out uh, except for maybe the bigger picture plot which kind of chips away at everything else. Right, right. Yeah, I don't... Um, and actually on the point of following only the Mandalorian... Uh, I think the opening scene of this episode might be the first scene we've had all season where Mandalorian wasn't present. Not that I don't think that really means a whole lot, but just something I took notice of. I mean, he's in, I think, literally every scene you except for that one. Maybe that's why I thought it felt like a flashback. Yeah, I think we're trained to... Bo- the only scenes so far that we've seen without the Mandalorian were flashbacks, and they were children, village people... So I think we've been trained when we see a scene like the one that opened this episode to assume this is a flashback. Right. But it's an interesting thing. I wouldn't mind if we started to cut away to other characters. Yeah. And and I wouldn't mind the quote unquote filler episodes if they were just executed a little bit better. And and all the things I like about this show 
were here this episode, but the things I don't like, just for one reason or another, rubbed me the wrong way more this episode than in previous ones. But like I said, definitely still on board for this show. Uh, looking forward to seeing what episode five brings us. Will we see the Mandalorian take off his helmet in this season of the Mandalorian? I was thinking no. Last episode, after this one, I think we will see it in the finale. Will there be any kind of a reveal to that, or is it just going to be Pedro Pascal? I think it's just going to be Pedro Pascal. I I was wondering that, too. There's no reason for us to assume he's a human under there until I remembered the flashbacks. And I guess, actually, in the flashbacks, we're assuming that child is him. Maybe that maybe there's a twist. There's a child behind that child that's him. <laughs> or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe when the robot in episode one says species age differently, that meant a little more than we thought. Oh, <laughs> very interesting. The droid goes to shoot the kid. We hear the shot ring out. And it's not. It's another. It is false. Pedro Pascal <laughs> shooting him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another false fire swerve. All right. Well, I think that covers it, right? Well, thanks for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go into the Apple Podcasts app, leave a review, leave a rating. And I always like to say, if you listen to this, that means you're awesome. If you leave a rating, that means you're even just a little bit more awesome. If you leave a review. Forget about it. You are top of the line, one of the best people on this planet. And make sure to check out youtube.com slash one take vids. We'll have a link in the show notes where you can see YouTube videos where we talk about the Mandalorian, Watchmen, movies, movie news, and other stuff. All right. Great. Subscribe, you hellmies. (laughs) <laughs> you need a loincloth for your face, face nude head? 